Well, you talked about tough love, right? You would try to justify. Oh, yeah. I, I realized that was a rationalization. Could, yeah. Could you help us understand that? Because, I mean, there is such a thing as tough love. Yeah. And, of course, love doesn't mean syrupy sweet. It does mean right. correcting in, yeah. in certain times. So how do you know if, and this is for me and for all of us watching, mm -hmm. when we're telling ourselves, I'm just doing tough love, how do we know when that's maybe inappropriate or unhelpful? I think it's usually inappropriate. Really? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Usually, um, usually... Tough love is not called for. Like if you think about parents and children, most of the time do you want to show your children so-called tough love or most of the time do you just want to show them regular love? Yeah. Tender, affectionate, understanding love is what I think is yeah. the best. Tough love is what you use with children as a last resort when something important is on the line and there's no other better way to deal with it. Like in fact, the way the phrase originated, because this is a fairly recent phrase, okay. and it's only been around for a few decades. Um, but when it, my understanding of it is when it first began to be used was kind of in the 1980s when you had irresponsible young people that were having the problem making the leap from being children to being adults. Um, this was not a thing a few decades earlier. Children couldn't wait to grow up and assume adult responsibility. Um, but as the uh, post-World War II economy flourished, people became affluent enough and there began to be more entry barriers to young people to adulthood, like everybody's got to go to college, mm. um, which had not previously been the case at all. But now everyone's supposed to get a college education. And that means what that had the effect of was it delayed entrance into adulthood for an extended period where young people had very few responsibilities. And so adolescence, the modern understanding of adolescence, that didn't exist, you know, 100 years ago or 200 years ago. This is a new thing. And it got worse over the course of the 20th century as the American economy expanded and you started having more and more kids living for years off the abundance of their parents and not really make, taking effective steps to become independent as adults and live on their own and pay for their own car and, you know, things like that. And so, and coupled with this was the 1960s and the, the, the counterculture rebellion against established establishment values, you know, like getting a job and stuff like that. And protesting the war was a big thing and taking drugs was a big thing. And so by the 1980s, you had a lot of young people who were sponging off their parents and didn't seem inclined to take responsibility for themselves. And a lot of them would get into trouble and their parents would bail them out of the trouble. And this would happen repeatedly. Mm. And eventually, um, this idea of tough love developed, that the real way to be loving to my child is not to enable this pattern of irresponsible behavior. So, you know, son or daughter, I love you, but the next time you get into a situation like this, I'm not going to bail you out. You're going to have to deal with this on your own. And this is my way of loving you mm. to help you get to the point in life that you need to be where you're functioning as a responsible, autonomous individual. So you're dealing with something that's high stakes and you're dealing with it as a last resort. So in those circumstances, I think tough love is appropriate. Um, but if you're in an apologetic context and you're trying to win someone over to your position, the way you do that is not by trying to humiliate them. The way you do that is by trying to be understanding and friendly so they can see you're a good person and you're friendly to them and you're trying to help them. And that will enable them to think through, well, he's trying to understand me in my position. Maybe I should think through his position for, and, you know, take his arguments more seriously as opposed to just looking down on other people. I think that's one of James, I think that's James White's biggest flaw as an apologist. He looks down on other people constantly. He doesn't try to understand things from their perspective. If you listen to his Dividing Line show, the amount of apologetic content is actually quite small, and most of it is looking down on other people. And that will attract a certain number of people who have that, you know, chest-thumping, feeling-your-oats sensibility. 
but it's going to hamper his apologetic effectiveness in terms of actually winning people to his position. Yeah, those are all very good points. Um, but let me maybe push back a bit and sure. see, you know. Push away. Well, I agree with everything you've said. But if you live in a day and age where atheism is king, say, you know, mm -hmm. during the 2008, nine days where mm -hmm. everything was atheism and they were very condescending towards us, it was incredibly heartening mm -hmm. to see Christians no longer cower, mm -hmm. but get up and swing and swing hard, mm -hmm. you know? It, 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 so it, is there something to be said for manfully dismantling uh, evil or false mm -hmm. position in a, in a manful way, you know, in order to embolden those who are cowering, feeling like maybe my religion isn't something oh, sure. that's defensible. Oh, sure. But there, there are different ways of doing it. Um, back during the Cold War, um, in the 1960s, Nikita Khrushchev came to America and went to the United Nations. And he, he famously did a, an act that was regarded as being rather petulant. He, he took off one of his shoes <clears throat> and starts banging on his, uh, the little, you know, podium table, yeah. podium in front of him with his shoe. And, and everyone's looking at him like, what the heck's going <laughs> on, dude? Um, and the response that was given was by the British ambassador to the United Nations. And it was regarded as a crushing, disarming response. All he did was he said, uh, I'm still waiting for the translation on that. <laughs> very good and and so there are ways of being devastating yes. and being kind at the same time like i tried to be in my bart ehrman debate i see i tried to be as devastating as possible and as kind as possible all right let me give you an example though because i really like this when mm -hmm. ed phaser said of richard dawkins he wouldn't know the difference between metaphysics and metamucil come on that's good well it involves wordplay <laughs> but it's good. I like it because mm -hmm. it's snarky. I like that he took yeah. a shot at somebody who who's. I appreciate the value of snark um, <laughs> as much <laughs> as the next guy. <laughs> uh, however, I I think snark is principally for in house consumption, and and it it doesn't. It, it will work for some people. Um, and, and there's a place for gentle humor too, which is not the same thing as snarkiness. Um, but for the most part, it, I'm still laughing at the, I'm still waiting on a translation for that. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a it's very great good. response. It's very good because you were the adult in the room Yeah, and you, you took it lightly. It yeah. was very good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, the, it, it's a way of claiming the high ground without, yeah. without being mean about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> And and in any event, uh, I I think you know the famous saying of moms: you catch more f more flies with hunt with with honey, honey than with vinegar. vinegar is true, yeah. and that applies in an apologetics content context. Usually, being nice and friendly and positive will win more souls than than being negative and superior. Yeah, and, and maybe and un maybe unless your goal is not to win over your opponent, oh, but, sure. but, but to embolden mm -hmm. your tribe. And there's something to be said or, about that. Or if you're a martyr, you okay. know, if, if you want to get crucified, by all means, call your enemies a nest of vipers. Uh -huh. Jesus deliberately provoked I see. I see. Yeah. the Jewish authorities. That's right, what the clearing right. of the temple is all about. He is setting up his own crucifixion. So this is not advice that applies in every situation. Okay, this is good. But yeah. recognize the situation in which Jesus would do this. He was being deliberately antagonistic yeah. to set up his own death so that he would redeem us all. Yeah. Well, that doesn't mean unless you're Jesus, <clears throat> unless you're going to redeem us all, <laughs> you should be doing the same thing. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it wasn't just for that reason, presumably. He was also you, you calling know, them to repentance through this harsh language. In typical with the uh, prophetic mode of language that they were used to okay. in their culture. Yeah. Our culture does not talk, does not have prophets that talk that way. Mm, okay. And so you have to adjust your language depending on the cultural context you're in. Yeah. It's like even here in the US, <clears throat> you know. Um, there's a difference between northern culture and southern culture. Um, people from New York, for example, are famous for being blunt. Yeah. 
And they can regard the politeness of Southern culture as you're being disingenuous. Yeah. Whereas from a Southern point of view, the Northern bluntness, the New York bluntness can be seen as really offensive. Yes. Whereas in the South, we're trying by being by being charming and friendly, we're trying to make everyone happy and mm-hmm. and and keep things at a at a nice cool temperature. Um, both communication strategies are effective. You just have to understand what the communication strategy is and use it in appropriate circumstances. I I, I don't I, I don't know how many folks you know from the Middle East, Not but many. but I've known quite a few. You know, uh, for example. Um, San Diego, or specifically El Cajon, where Catholic Answers is based, um, has, uh, you know, Maronite. It's like a quarter Chaldean. Yeah. It also has Maronites. There's lots of people from the Middle East there. And they come from a very blunt culture. Right. Um, and I get along with them great. Um, I was one of two Americans in a class of over 30 Iraqis. <laughs> In 2003, when the U.S. invaded Iraq, I mean, we were in class and they're getting calls on their cell phones about their villages being liberated and stuff. And but going into that class, I knew I'm one of two Americans in this class. Everybody else, including the teacher, is is an Iraqi Chaldean. Um, It's going to be like being in a class of New Yorkers, only more so. (laughs) And it was, you know, the 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 instructor would do things that were totally not from my culture. I mean, he would turn to students and say, that is horrible, horrible. <laughs> and, but he didn't mean to be cruel to them. And it wasn't perceived. And, and it way. wasn't perceived as being yeah, cruel. Yeah, yeah. So it, the communication strategy you use yeah. is, is culturally dependent. It's dependent on context. They're just different communication strategies, but an underlying principle that applies in all contexts is if you can convince the other person that you're on their side and you're trying to help them, Mm -hmm. then they will be more receptive to your message than if they perceive you as antagonistic and superior. Yeah. This is why my wife, when we lived in San Diego, she would love the Maronite women Mm -hmm. because my wife tends to be quite blunt and choleric by Uh nature. So when she would meet these women, she'd be like, oh, finally, I can talk to them without them feeling intimidated by Mm -hmm. me, you know? Hey, thank you so much for watching. Before you go, do us a favor, leave a comment, let us know what you thought of the video, like, and subscribe.